Welcome back to Agrin Infotech. In today's video, we're diving into the fascinating world of time series analysis in R. If you've ever wondered how to dissect and understand time-dependent data, you're in the right place. We'll be exploring how to choose the perfect ARIMA function order for time series analysis using the Air Passengers dataset. We shall do this step by step, from visualization to model selection. So, let's get started. Our journey begins with visualizing the data. We want to uncover any hidden patterns, trends, or seasonality within the Air Passengers dataset. To do this, we'll use a few essential libraries. First, we load the necessary libraries, including ggplot2, to help us with plotting. Now, let's create a plot of the time series data. This plot is a key starting point in our time series analysis journey. We're using ggplot, function from a popular data visualization library called ggplot2 to help us create this plot. The geometry underscore line function is used to draw a line chart that connects data points over time. We specify the x-axis using aesthetic function, which means we're plotting time on the x-axis. The y-axis is set to represent the passenger count. We add labels to our x and y-axis with labs function, making it easier to understand the chart. Lastly, we apply a clean and minimal theme to the plot with theme underscore minimal to make it visually appealing. In a nutshell, this code helps us visualize how passenger counts have changed over time, which is crucial for understanding the underlying patterns in our time series data. The plot reveals some exciting insights. We see a clear upward trend and a repeating pattern approximately every 12 months, indicating both trend and seasonality. Next, we delve into identifying seasonality by creating ACF and PCF plots. We notice a 12-month pattern, but let's investigate further. ACF stands for autocorrelation function and PACF stands for partial autocorrelation function. We're using the PAR function to set up our plotting area. This function essentially divides our plotting space into two rows, with the first row dedicated to the ACF plot and the second row for the PACF plot. Next, we use the ACF function to create the ACF plot. ACF helps us understand how each data point in our time series relates to its past values. The lag.max parameter specifies the maximum number of time lags to consider. In our case, we're looking at up to 36 lags. Similarly, we use the PACF function to create the PACF plot. PCF is a bit more focused, it shows the relationship between a data point and its past values while removing the influence of other time lags. These plots are vital because they provide insights into the autocorrelation structure of our data. In the ACF and PCF plot, the horizontal axis represents the lags, which are time intervals between data points. The lags are labeled as fractions of a year, ranging from 0 to 3.0, corresponding to months in the time series data. The vertical axis represents the partial autocorrelation values. These values indicate the correlation between each data point and the data point at specific lags, while controlling for the influence of all the lags in between. At lag 0, which is the correlation of the data with itself at the same time point, the value is always 1. This is because any data point is perfectly correlated with itself. As you move away from lag 0, the autocorrelation values vary. Positive values indicate a positive correlation, while negative values indicate a negative correlation. Lags with autocorrelation values close to zero suggest a weak or no correlation between the data points at those lags. Peaks or troughs indicate strong positive or negative correlations, respectively, at those specific lags. It appears that there is no strong or consistent correlation at most lags, which is a positive sign as it suggests that your model has effectively captured the underlying patterns in the data. However, it's important to note that autocorrelation at some lags may still exist but is not statistically significant, as indicated by values within the strip lines area. In general, the PACF plot shows a lack of significant partial correlations at most lags. Some other lags show intermittent weak correlations, but these are not statistically significant. These weaker correlations might be due to noise or random fluctuations rather than meaningful patterns. Now, let's move on to a crucial step in our time series analysis journey, first-order differencing. This step helps us make our data more stationary, 
which is important for accurate analysis. First, we perform what we call first-order differencing using diff function. Essentially, we're calculating the difference between consecutive data points in our passenger count over time. Once we've computed these differences, we create a plot to visualize them. We're using the ggplot2 library again. In this plot, we have the years on the x-axis and the differenced passenger count on the y-axis. The difference data appears more stationary, with fluctuations around a constant mean. Further differencing may not be necessary. Now, we're stepping into the heart of our time series analysis, finding the best model to understand and forecast our data accurately. This code is responsible for the complex task of searching for the optimal model, and it involves multiple combinations and calculations. We start by initializing two crucial variables, best model and best AIC. Think of best model as a placeholder for the best model we'll find, and best AIC as a placeholder for its corresponding AIC value, which measures how well the model fits our data. We set best AIC to an initial value of infinity to ensure any model we find will have a lower AIC. Now, the code enters a series of nested loops, where it iterates through various combinations of model parameters. These parameters define how our time series model operates, and we want to find the best combination. For each parameter combination, the code fits a seasonal ARIMA model to our air passenger's data. This model is a powerful tool for time series analysis. We use a try-catch block to handle any potential errors during model fitting. If a model fails to fit, for instance, if it's not suitable for our data, it's captured as an error, but we keep searching. When a model is successfully fitted, we calculate its AIC value. The lower the AIC, the better the models fit to our data. If the current model's AIC is lower than the previously best AIC, we update best model and best AIC with the details of this new, better model. Finally, after all combinations have been tested, we print out the details of the best model and its associated AIC. Our best fitting model has non-seasonal ARIMA orders of 3, 1, 3, and seasonal ARIMA orders of 1, 1, 1, 12. Our model, model's estimated variance is approximately 113, with a log likelihood of minus 498.85. The AIC value for this model is 1013.69. These values tell us that our model effectively captures both non-seasonal and seasonal patterns. The AR and MA coefficients indicate the model's ability to account for autocorrelation and moving average effects. The lower AIC value suggests a better fitting model among those we've tested. Now that we've found our best fitting model, it's time to put it to the test and ensure its reliability. This code is all about checking the residuals of our model which are the differences between our model's predictions and the actual data points. We start by calculating the residuals of our best model using residuals function. These residuals represent how well our model captures the actual data. Next, we create two plots to examine these residuals. The first plot uses ACF function to create the autocorrelation function plot, which helps us understand if there's any remaining correlation in the residuals. The second plot, PACF function, stands for partial autocorrelation function and gives us more insight into the correlation structure of the residuals. Autocorrelation is not significant, as seen in the ACF and PACF plots. We then perform a statistical test called the Ljungbox test using box.test function. This test checks if there's any significant autocorrelation left in the residuals. If the p-value is low, it indicates that there might still be some patterns in the residuals. The Ljungbox test supports the absence of significant residual autocorrelation because the p-value higher than 0.05. In other words, the residuals appear to be uncorrelated with each other at different lags. Moving on, we create a histogram of the residuals using hist function. This helps us see if the residuals follow a bell-shaped curve, which is a characteristic of a normal distribution. The histogram revealed that the residuals approximate a normal distribution, indicated by the histogram. Additionally, we create a QQ, quantile quantile, plot with QQ norm and QQ line functions. This plot allows us to compare the distribution of the residuals to a theoretical normal distribution. 
If the points closely follow the straight line, it's a good sign that our residuals are normally distributed. Lastly, we perform a Shapiro Wilk test using Shapiro.test function. This formal statistical test checks if the residuals are normally distributed. A low p value might suggest that the residuals deviate from normality. The Shapiro Wilk test suggests a slight departure from strict normality, possibly influenced by the sample size. In summary, our best fitting model has adequately captured the air passenger's data's underlying patterns. While there's a minor departure from strict normality, it's essential to consider this in your specific context. Remember to monitor your model's performance and assess its forecasts with out of sample data. That wraps up our time series analysis in our journey today. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. Feel free to leave any questions or comments below, and we'll be happy to assist you on your data analysis adventures. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.